Hey folks, hey Tuesday, new month, was it a new month last week? I don't know. I don't know, I barely know where we are. Okay, so um, we're on networking. So homework one grades are sent out. As I sent out the main list, I made a little mistake on mapping the grade to the part number. So just increment all the part numbers by one, two, three, four. Should be very clear. I just don't want to send you all another email. So uh, homework two will be graded tomorrow. By next class, you'll have your homework two graded, and the midterm grade will be graded shortly as well. So you'll get the same emails, but now appended with your new score every time, so you'll know where you are. And on Thursday, we'll have a new awesome networking homework assignment. We'll finally, through today, cover enough of networking that we can have an awesome assignment on this. Yes, more assignments, yes. We like that. Your projects are actually fun compared to like, some of the other stuff, so. Cool. All right, I'll mm -hmm. do more next time. Thanks. Cool. <laughs> uh, what well, security stuff? You guys are, like actually break stuff. Like, that's, I don't know. My philosophy is like I can stand up here and teach you and even force you to memorize all of the theory behind all of these attacks, but until you can actually do it yourself, that's a completely different gap in knowledge. So being able to actually do attacks is way different than knowing the theory behind an attack and how that works. So, uh, so that's the goal. Cool. All right. So we're talking about TCP. So what is the point behind the three-way handshake that we started off with on Thursday? Ensuring you have a connection where? What kind of connection? That's what you don't answer. Well, it's a stable connection. I won't necessarily say secure just yet. Correct. I would definitely not say secure. <laughs> uh, but we know that we have a, so with a three way handshake, so we're going to first send what type of packet from the client to the server? The client wants to initiate a connection. What's the first packet it sends? What? No, it has to. Well, it's going It will send an IP packet, but that will be encapsulated inside a TCP packet. So at this point, we're talking about the TCP level. What's the packet that it's gonna send? TCP to the server? packet with a SYN flag. With a SYN flag. So it's gonna send a SYN packet, and then the server's gonna get that and send back what? So actually, if you think about it, 
the packets to even talk to a TC, uh, another server on TCP, we need three, we need, we need, wait, we need, uh, one, two, three, we need three essentially trips or round trips from us, the client to the server and the server to the client, right? So this actually adds a decent amount of latency to your communications, right? So rather than just sending in the first packet all the data you want to send, we actually, so if you could think of this, and the way I think of this, is this is kind of the overhead you have to pay in order to guarantee that the other side is receiving your packets, right? Without this, you just use UDP and you start throwing data at them, but you have no way of knowing whether they actually receive any data on that other side. Cool. So now we want to send data. What do we do? What are the guarantees that TCP provides us about the data? In order, which means the client, the server or the client, which everyone is sending data, will receive the data in the same order that the other side sent it. Right? So it's in order, what else? So we have to think of what are all the properties we actually want from this. So it's in order, what are the properties? It's all there. It's all there. Yeah. So if uh, the way to kind of think about this is if they receive data n, that means they've received n minus 1, n minus 2, n minus 3, and all the data up until that point. Cool. So how do we actually do that, right? So we go back to our nice drawings. Because, you know... So they both choose random numbers, but 
they're going to be auto incrementing from there. So you can think of them as starting at zero, right? So if you zero out essentially where they start, so that that way they can say one side, so I send you 50 bytes, and then the other side will send an acknowledgement to say, yep, I've seen up to 50 bytes. And then I send you another 50 bytes, and they say, great, I've seen up into 100 bytes. And now the client knows that the server has seen those bytes. Did I lose my? Mm -hmm. Man, who is using all these batteries? I don't think so. There's like a whole charging system. <coughs> It's always so difficult to do while I talk. <coughs> All right. Do that. Put this one in. Cool. So there's a slight. So another thing to think about. So let's say I just wanted to send. We know an IP packet can send up to 65,000 bytes. So as the client, can I just send 65,000 bytes and 65,000 bytes and 65,000 bytes? To the server, why would that not be a good idea? Testing. All right, good. <coughs> yeah. That's like a lot to send without any sort of confirmation that it's like good. Yeah, it's a lot of information. Send A, we actually don't necessarily know who we're talking to on the other end. What if we're talking? I guess I you used to be able to use a notion of a phone, but now they have a lot of processing power. But what if you're talking to some super low powered IoT device that only has a meg of memory, that you literally doesn't have 65,000, that has literally nowhere to store all that data you're sending, right? So there's another component that will kind of gloss over, but it's important to be aware of is each side actually includes in its header its window, which says, I will accept up to 2,000 or 1,000, whatever bytes. So that, that way, the other side knows to respect that and will only send data that's inside that window. Um, and so now, once, we, once one side has sent data, the other side will send an empty ACK packet back if it had nothing to send and increment its acknowledgement number to say, great, I've seen up to byte. 50 or 100, as we saw. Um, and so this is how the, the, the communication proceeds. So the client, let's say, sends 25 bytes to the server. So it's saying sequence number 6575. Uh, it's acknowledging that the last thing, it, so remember, every time there's a communication, you acknowledge what you've seen so far. So I've seen up to 7612. And it's an ACK packet with 25 bytes. And so the server gets this and says, great. I'm still at sequence number 1612. So from the server to the client, I was only set up until that. And I've seen 6575 plus 25, so at 6600 bytes. That's what I'm acknowledging I've seen up until. And the server can then send 30 bytes, so this doesn't have to be a null byte, a zero byte acknowledgement, and then the client will then acknowledge that with an empty data packet that should acknowledge 30 bytes more. So this is how this works. So let's look at this and see why this works. So you can think about the client wants to send some data to the server, right? So there's a bunch of data, it's stream oriented, so there's no things as new lines, you can just send whatever data you want to send to the server. And the server has some stuff it wants to send to the client, uh, to the client, right? So the client sends a packet, says, okay, here's 50 bytes, right? Let's say everything starts at sequence number zero. So when the server gets that, what should it respond back as the acknowledgement number? Fifty, right? So it's seen up until fifty bytes. Now, at this point, when the client receives this acknowledgement, now it knows that the server has absolutely for sure seen those fifty bytes. Those are seen by the other end. It's a hundred percent that the server got it, right? So that's how you get that guarantee. 
So let's say I send, and we won't go into it, but you can send multiple packets, <coughs> multiple bytes. So you can say, let's say I send 50 bytes and then 50 bytes. So it's inside the window, I can do that, it's pretty small. And so the client, actually maybe the better way to do this is this is the client's view and the server's view. Oh, that's a little better. Okay, server, no. Server, okay. The server sees, when it gets its first packet of 50 bytes, it says, great, I've seen up until here, it's acknowledged by sending an act packet with a sequence uh, with an acknowledgement number of 50. And so now everybody knows that the communication is here. So let's say I send this 50 packet and that packet gets duplicated somehow. So there's two packets that say, so the client is going to send a packet saying this is sequence number uh, of 50 and here's 50 bytes. Right? So the, the server's going to get two of these packets. So let's say it can't get them both at the same time. So the first packet comes in, what does it do? Yeah, same as before, right? It says, great, here's the 50 bytes I need. Here it is. Send back an act. Acknowledge. Do I acknowledge 50? 100. So I've seen 100 bytes so far, right? So we're good. But then it gets the next packet in. Does it add that 50 bytes here? What does it do? What was that? Yeah, it just drops it, because it knows the packet that it gets in says sequence number 50, and it says, okay, sequence number 50, wait, I've already seen the data from sequence number 50 and the 50 bytes. So this packet is useless to me, I'm just gonna drop it. And similarly, let's go, too much, all right. Let's go back to our example. So we send two packets, right? We send, this is sequence number 50, here's 50 bytes, and then sequence number uh, 100, here's another 50 bytes. So these are two packets from the client to the server, right? Sending this chunk of data and then this chunk of data. So let's say this first packet gets dropped somehow. So the second packet comes in, and what does the server do? server's view of the data that's trying to be sent. So has it already seen that data, like in the last case? No, it hasn't seen this data before. Does it know where it goes? No? Sure. Yeah, sequence number 100, so it goes 50, 100, and it goes, this data goes here, right? But, so now it can put 50 bytes in here. But when it sends an acknowledgement back, can it say that I have seen, remember the acknowledgement says I have seen up until uh, 150 bytes. Can it say that? No, but what has it seen up until? 50. So it'll send back an acknowledgement of 50 and it'll wait. And so the client will see that and say, hey, I sent two packets, but the server has only seen up until 50, so I should resend those, right? Because the server knows what the client knows, and something has happened, so it'll probably just resend these bytes. If this packet goes through, then it says, okay, great, these are 50 bytes here, and then I'm gonna act at 150, because I've seen up until there. And now they both have seen and know that each other has sent a total of 150 bytes up until here, and they've transmitted exactly those contents. Yeah? Will it, <coughs> will it act? It'll act for both of them, though. We'll act for both packets that it sees. Yeah, exactly. But the client will only care about essentially the latest act. So there's a lot of other like details and mechanisms in here of exactly how long you wait before retransmitting and what you do about drop packets and all this kind of stuff. But it really this is here. 
But it's important to understand how this actually happened, this um, component here. Cool. So now, so we set up a connection. We started talking. What else do we want to do? Stop. We want to shut it down, right? We want to say, we're done talking with you, right? Because we can't just, it's not a C string. We can't just send a null byte. Right? We're agnostic of whatever content we're sending. We actually don't care what the data is, the bytes of the data. But we want some way to say, hey, I'm done talking with you. Let's shut down this connection. So this, because we have a, two, uh, a, a dual duplex, so either side can send, either side can actually say, I will not send any more data on my, on my uh, string. So it uses a fin flag. So fin, um, I believe it's like, <laughs> Probably short for finish. Um, and so the other partner then will act back and say, great, I acknowledge that I've seen this fin packet. And that way, both sides know that A was not going to send any more data to B ever. Then B can still send data to A until it decides it's done. So it sends a fin packet to B, and it's all over. So it's actually a pretty simple process. So basically, uh, the client will say, hey, I'm finished talking with you. And the server will acknowledge that. And then we'll also send its own thin packet back to say, I'm also done talking with you. And at this point, the four tuple of source IP, source port, destination IP, destination port is no longer considered a connection between the two. Right? At this point, they cannot send each other any more data. So now that we just had a crash course in TCP, what are some of the security attacks or uh, potential <coughs> things that we want to learn about a remote, let's say, server? So what do we want to learn about in UDP? something that's a little more high level than that. So when we think about it from a normal user land program, so you have to, you open and make a connection on a socket using the connect system call, which connects you to a remote system. 
So you would say connect on all the ports 1 through 65,000 uh, on that victim host. The interesting thing here is that this will actually cause a handshake. So this will cause a three-way handshake. So you'll do a sin, sin ack, and then an ack. And then you would say a fin to cancel the connection. Um, and if the handshake is successful, then the service is available, right? If it's not, we didn't talk about it, but there's a reset RST flag that usually is sent. So if you try to talk to a system, or if you try to, let's say, uh, initiate a three-way handshake, but you don't, you don't do it correctly, you miss one of the steps and you just start talking, the other side will tell you to reset, like you've screwed up this connection, so stop talking to me. Um, so this is good because you don't need to be root to do this connect scanning. You can just, any program can do that. Um, the disadvantage here is, like uh, Will mentioned, uh, is rather than sending just one packet and getting a response, here you're sending essentially three, two packets, right? You send one, you get one back, and you send another one, then you have to send fins, right? So it's actually really annoying, but uh, you can use Nmap, if I talk about Nmap, yeah. Uh, you can use Nmap has an option for this, and you can scan a host, and it will tell you of the as we talked about, it'll by default do the first 1,500 hosts, uh, and it will tell you which ones are open on the system. But this is a little, like we said, it's noisy, right? It's sending essentially the equivalent of three packets for every port that you want to test. <coughs> and so, well, why would we not? What's the, dis what's the disadvantage of being noisy? <coughs> We want to know about the remote. 
own system. So we may want to know what services are running, what other kind of information would we want to know? Operating system and applications that are running. Yeah, so we can figure out at least what, op what we can figure out what network applications are running or what servers are running because we can port scan, right? But why would knowing the operating system be useful? that don't necessarily conform to the TCP protocol and see how it responds. Some but why systems. would they respond differently? Because they're implemented by humans. Yeah, so well, so they're not so the key idea, right, is they all have different TCP IP implementation, right, in the operating system kernel itself. And so the specifications, if you read them, are not 100 percent specified of what everything should actually do. So they may make different decisions, right? So what do you do if somebody sends a reset packet in the middle of your communication? Do you ignore it? Do you continue? What happens if somebody sends you a reset packet that you've never talked to before? Do you send a reset packet first? Like, no, you talk to me weird first. <laughs> Don't talk to me again. Or do you just drop it, right? There's all these weird decisions that get made. And it turns out you can actually use these to fingerprint very specifically, um, the operating systems of remote systems. Um, or what happens if you just send a fin packet? So this is another example. So what if I just send you a fin packet out of nowhere? Do you ignore it, or do you tell me that's a reset? You shouldn't be sending a fin, pack, fin packet now. Um, what if we flip random flags that are never used in the TCP packet? Some implementations will actually reuse those flags when sending a reply back to us. Why? Because they do, and it doesn't affect the normal operation, right? So I think of it like you have, com you have completely different implementations of these TCP IP stacks, and so what you're doing is trying to find out behavior deviations there that obviously don't affect normal operations, but still tell you something about the operations. Um, what happens if I send a packet to you with a SID flag set, an <coughs> ACK flag set, a reset flag set, and a fin packet, fin flag set? The specification does not say what you should do there, but you have to do something, right? So how you reply is another fingerprinting mechanism. Um, and even things like how do you, what TCP numbers do you initially select? There could be some bias there. Or what's your initial TCP window size? This is actually a really big one that's pretty easy to fingerprint. Um, uh, how do you use, then you can move up, you know, you can try at all levels, right? Not just IP or TCP games. You can try, what about ICMP messages? What happens if I ping you, right? Or what's, send an ICMP ping message. Do you respond back? Um, what happens if I send you a weird ICMP message? I mean, it's all kinds of stuff. Like, what error rates there? Um, how much data do you include there? Um, and the really interesting thing, so when we just talked about being stealthy and generating less noise, 
Clearly here we're going to send a lot of packets to the remote system, right? But not for all of these features, right? If you can see what traffic that machine is sending, you may actually be able to get the initial TCP window size, which may tell you something. So there's actually tools that do passive OS fingerprinting that just observe traffic. So you use TCP dump, and then you run that through POF, and it will actually tell you a rough idea of what those operating systems are so you can explore them further. Uh, you can also, I believe, Nmap has an option, dash O, to do this fingerprinting. Uh, so you can run this against a remote system and figure out oftentimes very closely what operating system is running. Now I will say there is, it, it does get a little bit murky. You have to take your results with a grain of salt. Sometimes you'll scan something, it'll be like, that's an Android phone or something. And you're like, no, that's a server. Like, there's no way that's possible. But because Android devices use a Linux kernel, it can be difficult maybe to tell sometimes. So cool. So that's very fun games that you can play that are actually really relevant to performing penetration tests. So what other attacks have we played in the IP and UDP game? <coughs> What's the question? What other attacks have we looked at? So anytime you think about a new domain, Right? You want to think, okay, what, what are the attacks that worked in the last domain, and do they work here? So what are the attacks we talked about with UDP? So we talked about port scanning. What is some other stuff? So let's 
say, okay, so we have a client, just like before, because we have a, a client, and it's attached to some network, and then we're here, and then we have a server, right? So before, if we wanted to send a UDP packet and spoof it, send it to the client and spoof it as it, sorry, send it to the server and spoof it as if it came from the client, what would we do? Server set. Remember, it's all about sequence numbers. 
So our initial packet that we send, we'll call it a sequence, sequence number C. So we choose this, right? This is not an unknown value. But the server, when it sends back its send, send act, it includes the sequence of the server and, as its acknowledgement, the sequence of the client. So if we want to reply back with an act packet, we must know this sequence number of the server. If we do not know that, we cannot initiate a connection to the server. So what do we do? Are we screwed? Is TCP fundamentally secure now? What can we do? So now think like an adversary. Say that again louder. Um, we could send our own from ourselves to it and get the sequence number back from that and then use that sequence number to generate what the sequence number should be for the one that it sent the other one. Yeah, so we can guess, I mean, it's essentially guess the sequence number, right? So depending, this then goes back, so the idea here should be if I can guess that sequence number, then I can spoof <coughs> TCP packets and TCP connections. And I've essentially completely broken TCP, right? So you want it to be the case that if I send you a send packet and you send me back a sequence <coughs> number, should I be able to guess the next sequence number that you use? No, we would want that to be a property of our TCP stacks. Unfortunately, that may or may not be the case. So there's actually been a long history of breaking um, the sequence number generators of or the way that they generate sequence numbers in these in these things, and you maybe need to you only need to get right once, right? So even if it takes you sixty thousand tries, whatever, a hundred thousand tries, as long as you're right once and that allows you to compromise the server's security, you won, right? So fundamentally, you want this to be well. The sequence number is, I believe, thirty-two bits. So you know, two to the thirty-two is a lot of guesses. Right? So you will be very unlikely to get that. But if you're able to reduce that because it's not as random as it should be, then that would be really good for you as an attacker. But let's say it's super cryptographically secure random number generator. It's using like, it's got a hardware entropy thing that's <coughs> adding a bunch of randomness and it's just like crazy random. There's no way to guess it. Even no matter how many requests you make to that server, you will never be able to guess that sequence better than brute force 2 to the 32. Especially if we generate a new one every single time. Yes. So, what do you do? Game over? Go home? So the, the idea is we now basically have to see that packet, right? So we need to see that reply. We either have to guess that sequence number. If we cannot guess it, then it is basically impossible to do this remotely, right, without being on either of their networks. So where could you be? Where are the, the scenarios? You can be on the client network and you can do some ARP attacks to see this packet. What else? You can be on the same ISP? Or is that too broad? Too broad. <coughs> so think about in this diagram, right? You could be connected to the client network, maybe physically, maybe on their Wi Fi. Maybe you've broken into another machine on that network, whatever, it doesn't matter. You're, you have presence even on their local network. But is that all? Are there other avenues? What if the client is really secure or something? Be on the server network. Be on the server network. Yeah, you could be on the server network. Right? If I can somehow be on there, 
and sniff the traffic there and see that packet, then I can respond with the correct sequence number with my final hack. What else? Any other options? Yeah. Compromise anything that's in between them? Yeah, so remember the packets have to hop, right? There's actually, this is an oversimplified model, right? There's actually switches in here that these packets travel between. So I can compromise or take over any one of those switches local networks and see the traffic there, right? So there's actually a lot of ways depending on your threat model. So um, to see those packets. <laughs> And this is a very pretty old attack. Um, it was first discussed in 1985, and you can actually still read this uh, paper. Um, and there have been famous attacks, so Kevin Mitnick used this in an, in an attack. And so the idea is, basically, if there's any kind of IP-based trust, you can try to invalidate this trust. Um, one thing you have to worry about is going back to our example. Can you guys see that? <coughs> Okay, so assuming I send my first SYN packet to the server, the server replies back with a SYN ACK. What's the, where is that SYN ACK packet then going to go? The server is going to send back, S is going to send back this SYN ACK packet that we've drawn here.
It's actually super fun to do. All right. So we can actually try to go further. So spoofing initiates a connection, right? And says, this connection is coming, uh, is B trying to initiate a connection to A. But we may want to actually try to inject data into an already occurring TCP string, right? So one way to think about this is, uh, this is why we talk about uh, public Wi-Fi networks are so bad, is because anybody could be doing this to you, and anybody could be, uh, who's on that network, could be injecting um, some malicious JavaScript that takes advantage of exploits in your browser to execute arbitrary code on your laptop or your device. Um, so this is why this is so bad. So the idea with TCP hijacking is now, instead of we want to initiate a connection from B to A, now A and B are already talking, and we want to inject extra data in there. So think about uh, SSH is a bad example because it's encrypted. But think about like a telnet session, which is not encrypted. So it's the same thing, remote access. And there, let's say, adding an additional so they're sending commands, so if you could inject your own command into that TCP stream, that will execute on that server, so you could give yourself remote access or something. Um, and the idea, so, let's see, do we like this? Is this better than the way I used to do it? The problem is now I can't see it, so the drawings will only get worse. to its database server, and it has a failure mode when it can't connect to its database, it just lets everybody in or something, which would be more common than you think. Um, so if we can disrupt this connection, then that would actually be really good. But in order for our packet to be accepted by either side, what must be true? What do we need to actually do with our packet? How do we do that? Um, what do we have to change? Like, what what has to be true in our packets? Uh, IP, the port IP, the source IP, the source port, the destination IP, the destination port. All those have to be correct. What else? Sequence, sequence numbers. We've got to have the right sequence and acknowledgement numbers. If we don't, we're going to completely mess everything up. So, just like before, right? This is actually essentially the same problem. We can either eavesdrop on the traffic, so if we can see the traffic, we can know the sequence numbers and all the ports, or 
we can try to guess the sequence numbers and acknowledgement numbers. Again, if these are not randomly generated, we can completely break the security of this uh, TCP connection. And there's a paper on this if you want to check this out in more detail. So how does this actually work? Okay, this is actually really cool. So we're going to walk through an example here. So I want to inject some data. So let's go. So there we go. So well, even if you don't know Telnet, it's SSH without encryption. So the S in at the first, I guess the first S in SSH stands for secure. It's secure shell. Uh, Telnet is the non-secure version of that. It should be called non-secure shell because all your commands, everything, are sent over plain text. Whereas SSH encrypts the communication, so nobody can see what you're saying or tamper with it. But let's say we have a telnet session from C to S, right? And let's say we are eavesdropping on the traffic, so now we can inject our own command into here, right? So, do we want to just launch this? Oh, you guys can't see this. Oops. So, telnet from C to S. So let's say the user is logged in, typing away, typing and type. They're using Vim or Emacs and working on their homework assignment. Do we want to inject packets then? Depends on what our goal is. Depends on what our goal is? Why? We could just mess with them if they're in Vim and insert random characters into their stream. Yeah, so we can mess with them while they're while they're typing, but in order to actually do that, again, we have to guarantee we have to have have the correct acknowledgement and sequence numbers, right? And so if there's constant communication, those sequence numbers are constantly changing. So as an observer, it's very difficult to like inject the packet at the right time so that the sequence and acknowledgement numbers are the same. Even if you're seeing everything, because there may be jitter in the network, you don't necessarily know when your packet will get there. So what you really want to do is wait until the user like goes to go make a cup of coffee or something, or go talk to their friend, so there's no more communication on that channel. So at that point, you've been listening, and so you know the current sequence number of C, you know the current sequence number of S, and you know both the IPs and the ports. So you as the attacker, you're going to create a TCP packet, have the ports be correct. Uh, it will have its act flag because it will acknowledge. So, you're going to, so who do you want to spoof in this scenario? So who do you want to spoof here? You want to inject some information in this. Where, which direction do you want it to go?
this is the sequence number of C, right? They've both seen up here. So we send our packet, spoofing it from the client to the server. The server gets that and then does, how does that change its view here? Right, so it says, which is, well, that's okay, it doesn't know that yet, but from its view, it says, okay, the client has now sent, so this would be, let's say our payload is 100 bytes. Doesn't matter, whatever the length of the payload is, is what it's seeing, and now our payload is in here, the operating, uh, the operating system will pass this up to the SSH or the telnet process, which will then process this and execute this command. But, so when the server gets this packet, what does it send back to the client? An ACK that received the ACK. An ACK of what does it acknowledge up to? How many bytes has it seen? Sequence C plus 100. So we go back to our thing. So we send this packet out from A to S. S will then send a packet to C, uh, a TCP packet with an ACK of sequence C plus 100. The client gets that packet and says, no, that's not right. The sequence number, it will acknowledge back and say, actually, my current sequence number, I've only sent you up to sequence of F, a sequence of C. And then the server will get that and say, no, I've seen up to sequence of S, a sequence of client plus 100. They'll keep sending each other packets back and forth until one of those packets gets dropped. And they said, that's right, that's what I thought. We are at whatever is correct. So you've actually, as an adversary, you've desynced their views, right? So they both have different views, where the client, sorry, the server thinks they're up here, but the client knows they've only sent this much traffic. So you've actually completely <coughs> messed up their communications, and from here on out, they cannot talk to each other anymore. So as an adversary, then, you've done your, you've got, you've sent your payload, your payload was executed, so what would you, what do you want to do? Huh? Laugh maniacally. Laugh maniacally, and then what? Because they're going to keep doing this weirdness, and there's going to be all this weird traffic that's going to be generated. Send the uh, spoof from the server side to the client, right? <coughs> Saying that the server being like, oh, uh, well, essentially, like, oh, no, I never got this data. We're back down to, could you send a? You could, but that would be, you'd have to, s so, it all depends on where you are. If you are actually a person in the middle and you are on a router and can replace packets, what you can do is you can basically substitute 100 bytes from whatever acknowledgement the server sends the client. So then there you've kind of hidden that data there, but you have to actively be able to drop their packets or change or alter their packets. Oftentimes you may not be able to do that because you can't necessarily control what they send. So why not just tell them to stop talking? Have you ever come back to a SSH terminal and have your connection be dropped? Yeah, it happens all the time, right? You don't know why, like random stuff happens constantly. Maybe it was a, the, whatever the, what's the, maybe physics person, what's the beams that come and like flip bits? Uh, the gamma rays? Some kind of rays. I'm not crazy, this is a real thing. Okay, because you're nodding. Either you're nodding out of crazy or you're nodding in agreement. Um, did I tell you the story about the supercomputers? Yes. In this class? Okay, cool. Yes. So flipping bits, like maybe some bit randomly flipped somewhere and that causes the connection to end. Like whatever. So if you can already spoof this, you just send your thing. You'd send this packet and then you'd send a fin packet and you're done. And the communication's dropped. Right? And maybe they'll reestablish, but you've already had communication there. So this is just basically the idea is um, you've essentially desynced it, and so um, here, we can see this, so you spoof this, and you will get an act back, and you'll keep getting these weird acknowledgements back and forth. Um, cool. Um, awesome, so you can use these spoofing techniques if, and this is the key, if you can guess or 
eavesdrop the sequence number, then you can completely break the TCP connection and inject data into it. So even though it seems like there's an additional level of security because you send a packet and you get a reply, right? There's actually not a lot, I mean, fundamentally, there's not a lot more security uh, components there. Um, so we talked about taking a server offline. How would we do that? So we talked about, you know, we're basically breaking here confidentiality uh, by injecting into the stream or integrity by injecting into the data stream, right? But what about availability attacks? What kind of availability attacks do we do here? And we've actually already seen that those would be useful, right? Sometimes we want to, as an adversary, make sure that a certain machine does not respond. So you want to take out another machine. How do you do that? Yeah, so there's, the way to think about it is there's actually different ways. You could, um, and they actually really correspond to the layers of the networking stack. So you could literally send so much traffic that it saturates the ethernet cable connected to that computer. And literally not enough data can come there. Um, that is hard to do. That would be a hard thing to do. Easier would be one level up, would be try to hit the router. Try to overload the router that's right before the hop to that system so the router can't handle the, the amount of packets that are being sent. Um, again, that is also hard to do. Why? Can you do that from your computer at home? Probably not. What's going to fail first, your home router or the router that's in front of an Amazon.com server? Probably your home router. Those network commercial grade uh, switches are pretty high grade. Um, and you have to think about it in terms of leverage, right? So to be able to do that, you need to be able to send out as many packets as it takes to take down that server. So if your machine is not physically capable of doing that, then you cannot do that, right? So then another way, so actually most denial of service attacks are all about leverage. So if I send you 10 bytes, and it, or if I can send you know, 10 packets per second, and your switch is processing 10 packets per second, I don't have any leverage there. Because I have to send, if it takes 500 packets per second to take down your server, I have to send 500 packets per second, right? But if I find a way where I send one packet per second and that causes 100 packets per second to go through your switch, now I found some leverage, right? Where I send one packet and I get 100x leverage. Uh, so we can actually take this idea to attacks on the server side. So one way I can take down a server is maybe it consume too much memory, right? So. Think about this from the server's perspective. So a client sends a SYN packet to the server. What does the client then have to do? What's inside that SYN packet? IP addresses, port numbers, and what else? A sequence number. And then the client sends back what? A SYN act. And then what do they do? What does the server do? So the server sends a SYNAC, and then what happens? From the server's perspective? They wait. They just have to wait. And, what, and when they get the acknowledgment back, how do they know that it was the acknowledgment to the initial SYN packet? The sequence number matches the port and IP address. So think about it this way. I, as a attacker, I send one packet, a SYN packet, and I can cause the server to store memory. <coughs> because they have to remember the sequence number, the, the IP addresses, and the ports. But I don't have to store anything. I store zero amount of information. All I have to do is send SYN packets. So this is a SYN flooding attack. If you flood the server with SYN packets, 
And for every sin packet, for however long they wait for the, sin, uh, for the final act, they will hold that memory. So you make the server use more and more memory so it can't accept any more incoming connections. Okay, and then we'll wrap up next.